something that God specifically put on my heart for you. I'm going to preach the message next week. But God just really put in my spirit during times like this. And I've been talking to any staff, close leaders that I'm around, and they say, man, what a crazy weekend. It was amazing. Last year's amazing. And I tell them, I said, well, look, you got to protect the culture. They go, what do you mean? I said, this doesn't happen without a healthy culture. Healthy relationships, right? People believing, people standing, people learning, people growing, people serving, people uh, 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 sowing and serving. All of, It doesn't happen unless we're doing it with a cheerful heart, like Sandy said, right? And whatever we do, and loving one another, and not being accusers of our brethren, but be strength to our brethren. Amen? Can anybody say amen? So it's really important because I taught years ago, I read a book that just got my spirit Actually, a great man of God that was here before, Dr. Sam Chan, and uh, he wrote a book about culture, and he said, a, talk, a culture trumps vision. So if it's a good, healthy culture, it'll even grow the vision, jump it. But if it's a toxic culture, it will kill the vision. You can have all the tools, the knowledge, the favor, not favor, tools, knowledge, wisdom, anointings, all that. But if the culture's unhealthy, it can't produce much, if anything at all. It'll work against itself. So in that, Holy Spirit began to speak to me about you guys. And he said, you need to talk to them that what I did was release my favor. Release my favor on them at a new realm. He said, prophetically, as Prophet Harold said, take one step forward. He says, I have taken you a step forward in your favor, in my favor on your life. Now, when we talk about favor, and I'm gonna teach in depth about favor next week, so you wanna be here for it. But what I wanna talk to you about the message next week will be wind or winds of favor. The winds, W-I-N-D-S, of favor. We can define favor different ways, and I'll get into that next week. I think y'all understand the favor of God on your life is his glory, his spirit on your life. And we'll talk a little bit about here now. So I want you to realize everything about your personality, your intellect, your physical body, your history, everything about you, listen to this, is perfectly designed for obedience. Say designed for obedience. And I'm not talking about, you know, getting your hand slapped at school. I'm talking about obedience to the design God created you to be. Because the whole thing about this conference was really the focus was an uncommon anointing. Two streams come together, obviously, integrity and faith in God's word and demonstration and manifestation of his glory. Did anybody see his glory this weekend? And what is glory is doxa, manifested presence, made visible, seen, bright, shining, did anybody, did anybody receive integrity of, the integrity of God's word in your heart, right? Did anybody increase in your faith, right? That's what Two Streams is about. And the subcontext this year, God said, Two Streams Conference is for this purpose this year, because every year it has a purpose. This year it is to have an uncommon anointing or to receive experience an uncommon anointing to do kingdom exploits. And we have all been assigned by God to do certain things and to obey him and, and accomplish what he's called us to do while we're on this planet because God doesn't make junk, right? He makes king's kids. Amen. And so the entire weekend, and I talked to the men of God for the God here. I gave them some notes, things that's in my heart, and they were so fired up. I mean, Pastor Toya was back there smiling. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. They were ready to come out for the music. They were ready. And, and so was Pastor Isaac and the others as well. It was just an expectancy. And I, when you see an expectancy in the green room, you know what's going to happen out here. Amen. Nobody had to get out here and get cranked up. They came in cranked up. And I knew, look out, devil. We're going to slap you around this weekend. Amen? <laughs> Amen. And uh, so here's the key that I want you to get. Everything about you, your personality, your intellect, your physical body, your history, everything about you is perfectly designed for obedience. Obedience to God's word, obedience to the calling on your life, obedience to the plan he has for your life. Get this though. But disobedience, everybody say disobedience, 
violates the design. You have been designed for obedience because what lies in the obedience to God is the favor of God on your life. Yes. Favor to do exploits, to win and not lose, to live and not die, to be healed and not sick, to be prosperous and blessed without sorrow instead of being poor and living pitiful. To bring kingdom, uh, grow the kingdom and bring souls into the kingdom, to have a ministry of deliverance. That's not just for five-fold ministry gifts. That's for everyone born again. That's what the Great Commission is, co-mission. But get this now. Here's where a lot of times we get confused about trials and stuff. Both favor and trials drive us somewhere. There's been trials Steph and I have had, or I've had in my life, she's had in her life, and they, they stunk. They were horrible. But once we got through those, some of them lasted for years, especially being in ministry with church stuff and stuff, for years. But those trials ended up being a blessing. Like when I went through three years or so of depression, didn't know what depression was, when the economy crashed and we had, you know, seven and a half million dollars worth of debt and nobody to support us. The church grew in attendance, but it went down in income over 40% in, one, in two weeks. Because people lost their jobs, lost their businesses. But we still had an eight to $12,000 a month electric bill. At that time, we had a $48,000 a month payment. Add that to your budget and drop it 40%. Actually, it got down as low as 50 to 55%. We were bringing them 45 to 50% monthly for months and scrape them by. And we, that was coming into celebrating our sixth anniversary. We were five years and eight months old when we moved in this building. Celebrating our sixth anniversary in that year, we had Jesse DePlantis in. We had uh, Bill Winston in. Release of Faith is powerful. The last service my beautiful mom attended was Jesse DePlantis. It was everything she could get here to do. Just a couple of weeks, about a, two weeks later, she went to be with the Lord. I had to let a person go that was an administrator at the time that Steph and I trusted, brought in. And uh, right when mom died, he betrayed us and he was going around having members, meeting with them, saying we were stealing money and this was going on on top of everything because he was trying to get him some mission money that he never did. But anyway, so anyway, God exposed him, but it took several months and he'd done a lot of damage. All this was going on and I'm driving up on this property. I used to build my faith. I'm driving up like, Lord, that is a rope around my neck. If you'd let me, I'd run from this. I'd go start over, but he wouldn't let me. I'd drive up and I'd, be all, I'd just be angry when I'd drive up. Like, why would you give us this to fail? I, I, I got angry with God. I went through a tough time, but I got free. Somebody say, I got free. And I didn't realize how bad it got over about a three-year period. And I got free. And a lot of that was my lovely wife, Stephanie, and working with me and getting some help. You all would have never known it because I just, Mark never knew it. I will just come and preach and leave, come and preach and leave. But I was miserable. That's just trials, right? Since then, we've had trials. Before that, we've had trials, you know, ups and downs. But trials drive you somewhere. Say, trials drive me somewhere. I'm not the person I, I am if I hadn't went through those horrible trials you feel like it's a trial, you're on court, the court for your life, waiting on a jury. The only difference is we got Jesus heading up our jury. Amen. 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 So both, somebody say both. So I want you to get this. Both favor and trials drives us somewhere. It's like this. It's like a sailboat. When the wind drives me, let's see, it, it, where the wind drives me is determined by how I control the rudder on the boat that turns the sails. The wind is going to be the wind. If it's low north, south, east, west, how hard or whatever, the wind is not your issue. The winds of life, bad stuff's happened. Bad stuff happening to you is not the issue. Greater is he, where? In me. In me than he who is in his world. No weapon what formed against me can prosper. And if it thinks it's prospering, that means I'm going to get a hundredfold blessing on top of it when I live through it with my testimony and my confidence in God and my faith in God. I went from being angry with God to more in love with him as daddy instead of Lord and Savior only. I'm not the man that I, I was, and I'm glad I, I was a pretty good guy, 
But I'm, I'm much deeper, more of a father anointing now because I went through those trials. But also good things. Favor can drive you into good stuff. The rudder of your heart can drive you into good stuff or it can drive you into counterfeit stuff, pride. Uh-huh. So like several, the key is supposed to drive me deeper into God. The wind is. But what I, but both favor and trials can also drive us away from the Lord. But that's not how he designed it to happen. You, were, you weren't designed to fail, right? What happens is we begin to walk in disobedience. Well, unbelief is disobedience. Without faith, the Bible says in, in Hebrews, you can't please God, right? So we can't even please God if we don't have faith. So uh, no faith and unbelief is disobedience what? To God? No, to who he designed you to be. See, that's, see, you're looking at God, the wind, the world, and God, the world, and God, the world, oh my God. It's good when God moves. It sucks when he don't. He's, what's his problem? And the winds, why is everybody always picking on me? And then you get a victory, and you run a lap or two, and you're happy, and then the winds come again, and you don't have the rudder of your heart set right toward belief and faith instead of unbelief and pity. I'm going to preach this next week. I'm just giving you some highlights. So I've known people, and even in my life, I've experienced, and thank God, you know, he's pulled me back, helped me to get back, and it took my heart to decide too. But I know people that favor has driven them away from God. Disobedience has delivered them away from God. My mom always said, son, just remember, if the devil can't get you with the bad, he's going to try to get you with the good. Anybody ever heard that? That's a true statement. Now, the key is monitoring our heart because our heart, our value system, our attitude, our confessions is really what sets the rudder of the sailboat to properly negotiate the winds of life. What's my rudder? My heart, my attitude, uh, my belief system, all those things controlling my heart. I was talking to Pierce. We were talking about some stuff going to the ball game yesterday, and we got talking about some people we know and how they're just kind of, you know, walking in some unforgiveness about some things in their life. And I just said, son, one of the things I've learned in my life, the sooner I forgive, the, greater, the sooner I get relief, and I go to another level. And he said, well, I've seen that, Dad. I've seen you hug people, and I know what they said about you. And you were so, you were genuinely told them you loved them, and they were in shock. I said, you know why? Because my freedom was based on it. Yes. It wasn't their freedom. They have to decide how they're going to handle it. Because he'd be with a young boy and see me with, you know, ex-people that tried to hurt things here at the church wherever, and I see him at a ball game. I just hug him. Love you. God bless you. Why? Because I knew that I had already got free. I'd been free. I hadn't seen him in a year. I was free within a couple weeks, man, sometimes sooner than that, because I had to work on my freedom. Because I knew if I let that stay in my heart, I'll walk in the spirit of anger. And if I walk in the spirit of anger, I'll move into unbelief. Mm-hmm. So we got to monitor our rudder. We got to monitor our heart, our confessions, our belief system, our attitude. For example, the rudder of my heart is what's supposed to make me become the best possible example of who Jesus designed me to be. It's not about, I can't sin. Oh God, I can't sin. Oh Lord, I can't sin. I can't believe they sin. Then you start looking at everybody else. Well, I can't say that word anymore. And they said it, and they're supposed to be a Christian. I can't do that, and they did it. And you, you know, your belief system and all that. You're looking at what everybody else can and can't do, and then you're mad at God because you're convicted you can't, or you're condemned because you don't have enough knowledge of grace, but whatever that might be. And, and what happens is your heart keeps you in a place of unbelief. You can pray all you want to, but faith is the vehicle of God. Faith is the word, the language God speaks. He don't speak any other language, faith. And you can't walk in faith when you're walking in disbelief, anger, judgmental, spirit, whatever. Some of us, I was always harder on myself than other people. 
And I've had to work on that in my life, right? Because if you're a self-punisher, without knowing it, you'll punish others. Some of the staff years, been here years ago say amen to that, Pastor. <laughs> when the rudder is right, it moves me. Listen, when my rudder, my heart is contract toward God, when my rudder is right, it moves me into favor. But when it's wrong, it moves me into self-promotion. Well, how can the devil get you with favor? Pride. Because the Bible says what? Pride comes before the fall. So we can walk in great favor. We see this a lot with ministers. I've dealt with it in my life at times. Favor, everything's just easy. I go down the road and speak, Lord, church needs $10,000 a month income. I'm just driving. Next month, $10,000 income goes up to church. Just crazy stuff. Then there's times nothing happens. When I speak, pray, claw, fast, everything. Why? Because God's wanting me to adjust my rudder. It's the same wind adjust my rudder, the rudder of my heart. And, and I see that it's really even easier for musicians and singers or people with great talents because you get good enough, you don't have to practice that much. You, you definitely, you know, you've seen and been around the anointing enough, you can mimic it enough, you know. You, people think you're anointed, you can even convince yourself you're anointed. But if your heart's not right, let me tell you, you're not walking in the anointing that God wants you to walk in because he designed you with a greater anointing than you could think or imagine, which is greater favor. Can anybody say favor? Same way with me or ministers. If you've got a gift to preach and teach, I mean, you can, you can do it. But, but it's not doing it in obedience. It's doing it through disobedience, which can take that same favor and drive you away from God and his plan for you rather than putting you in God's plan. Pastor, why are you sharing this? Well, first of all, it's great revelation. Second of all, we have just come through two great conferences here. We're getting ready to do more this year again. And what I want you to realize is enjoy this. Take it in. When you get a victory, take it in. Let it be God. When you didn't get what you believe that you, didn't, you thought God said, check your heart. Me too. All of us have to. We got to what? Take care of the rudder. So I want you to take care of the rudder of your heart as I take care of the rudder of my heart. And then what happens is the church's rudder is taken care of because we are the church. We're the vessels that Holy Spirit is in in this house. So then the body as a whole goes to another level. Somebody say another level. Let me give you one example and I'm through. I think King Solomon is the best example of this, right? And why is that? Well, the rudder, when we look at King Solomon, <clears throat> well, let me, let me say this for, before it. When the rudder is right, it moves me into favor, but when it's wrong, it moves me into self-promotion. The winds of life weren't designed so that the winds of life weren't designed to do that, the wind, to go into self-promotion. They were designed to bring liberty, freedom, and through my will, it enables me to, if not, my will will begin to distort my divine purpose. In other words, if I'm in obedience, I'm fine. But if I get into, it, 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 it's not like you're disobedient all the time. You can be disobedient toward one situation, one person, one thoughts that are strongholds. The reason they're a stronghold, they're blocking your favor. Well, I got favor on my life. That's their problem. Oh, you do. Did you just hear what I just said? Let me tell you somebody have more favor than you'll ever have in your little pinky. King Solomon. He had more favor, really, than the Son of God because half the world was trying to kill the Son of God. Nobody's trying to kill King Solomon. I'm talking about favor with men. They didn't have more favor with God. But he had favor with God and with men because he asked for favor. The one gift, God said, what do you want from me? And he asked for wisdom. Well, wisdom brought favor. But is it the world's favor, the favor of men, or the favor of God? When he first got it, he got the favor of God, divine wisdom, understanding, knowledge, all those inner things to do amazing things with the nation of Israel. It's crazy, the things that he did. Um, no one single person that's a man on this earth or a woman has ever walked in such favor. But then we see the queen of Sheba, who was wealthy and probably the second greatest royalty on the earth at that time, the queen of Sheba, Sheba what, traveled an extraordinary distance with all kinds of wealth and goods. Why? Because she wanted to honor King Solomon. 
He had the most unusual measure of favor that maybe has ever been seen or would be seen. It'd be hard to find anyone else in history. Favor was to drive him into becoming all he was designed by God to be, the complete representation of who God designed him to be. But something got into his heart. Something got in there, and it says in one of the books of Kings, it says, but Solomon loved many women. You know, we hear a story, he had 900 concubines and so many thousand wives, whatever. It wasn't just, there's no way he could like uh, be with those women all the time, right? Or one time every three years or whatever. There's so many women. It wasn't marrying them for the lust of the flesh. He was marrying them for the lust of favor. He wasn't marrying them to get, he had physically beautiful women all around him. He was, oh, there's another beautiful one. I want her to throw in my concubine. No, that was the way other kings would cut covenant, he would marry one of their daughters, throw them in there in his concubine, and that meant they would have a peace treaty. You see, when he began, he had a treaty with God. The favor he was designed to walk in, which drew all those people to him. But then he got confused in his heart and went after the favor of men, and he did it men's way, and he married women from all different backgrounds and beliefs and witchcraft and all this crazy stuff, being in treaties with people he probably should have taken out of off the planet. He thought this brings peace, but all it did was bring the world's peace temporarily. And I'm telling you this right now, God set that man up to where Israel and the Jewish people would not be the, the ones that are, you talk about racism and all that. You go into any city, any nation of the world, there's people wanting to hunt and kill Jews. That is racism. Just like all racism's of the devil. But just think, for thousands of years it's been that way. And it, I'm telling you where it goes back to, King Solomon. They were the greatest kingdom on the planet. The greatest favor. And now what frustrates the devil, he still knows there's an inkling of God's favor on the Jewish people. So he's, he's not trying to kill flesh and blood. He's trying to kill the favor of God in the earth. Yes. Well, we're Christians. Well, honey, you wouldn't be a Christian if God didn't engraft you in the vine of the Jewish people. Well, get over your little self. Amen. People and their weird doctrines. Give honor where honors due. Well, Jewish people do some things. Well, Christians do some goofy stuff too, I noticed. Did you? Anyway, I don't want to get there right now. Kind of in a sweet spirit right now. I want to stay there, right? I mean, pray for me, Elder Mark. I, just, I don't want to get over in disobedience. But think about it. He was so smart and so highly favored, everything he did seemed to be right or righteous. But it wasn't righteous with God. It was right or righteous with men. And he continued to grow in kingdoms. And he continued to grow in wealth. And he continued to grow in favor. And he continued to grow in peace. The problem was it was counterfeit favor. So if God's blessing your family, God's blessing your job, God's blessing your health, God's blessing your businesses. God's blessing your ministry. Always be aware, God, where's the rudder of my heart? Is there anything buffeting again? That's why sometimes you'll be going, God's flowing, and you got something in your heart, and that rudder bumps. You know that rudder? You can set a sail ship, and you can just take some time off for an hour, and if that thing bumps a little bit and gets loose a little bit, it can totally, it can send you to another country if you left it there. It can send you into a false favor. His appetite for favor somehow drove him into a counterfeit favor, thinking God's favor wasn't enough. He wanted more. And what did it do? That was the greatest nation on the world. We would have never had to worry about, the, they would have never had to worry about the Romans or the Turks or anybody. They were the, the nation of all nations and blessed. But because he got into all of that, it opened up the door for Satan to sift the favor that God put in the earth. Well, I mean, how, how could that happen? Well, you need to read the first people that lost favor. 
Adam and Eve. God came down to cool the day and walked with them and talked with them. Genesis 2, 7, he, he created Adam out of the ground and created them. What did he do? He breathed life into them. They became a living, speaking soul like God. He created them in his own image, our own likeness. Have we created them, both male and female, and we put them in the dominion of the earth to go forth to pursue? What? To pursue, to take over, to put in charge of the, the, the foul of the air, the creeping on the ground, everything that swims, moves, lives, breathes. They're in charge. But there's one thing. Been like, why couldn't it be like a tree of lust? Or the tree of riches? Or the, you know, the tree of beauty? This one tree you cannot eat of, the tree of knowledge. You see, before that, they didn't know sin. They didn't know that God had wiped the world out, started over heaven. They didn't know the reason the world was created. They didn't know that the sin of the angels that were kicked out of heaven, a third of the angels kicked out of heaven. They didn't know any of that. All they knew was the goodness of God. It didn't rain. Dew came up and took care of it. They didn't have to worry about animals or nothing. It all took care of. They didn't have to go out and grow or raise anything. Everything was produced on their behalf from the favor God had on their life. When they were walking in obedience, we still don't know how. It could have been a million years. We don't know how many years. People are, I don't know. They say those bones are two million years old. Well, they could be. We don't know how long the Garden of Eden, and somebody tells you they do, they don't. They weren't here. So yeah, there's the planet could be five million years old. I don't really care. I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God spoke and bang, there it was. <laughs> oh, this tadpole will come over here and got in this slop and that was. Well, well, where did the tadpole come from? Well, it got in this algae and it come from this algae. Well, where'd the algae come from? But it was in this water. Where'd the water come from? Where, where did the ground, oh, don't get me going there. I was like, <laughs> people are so smart, they're stupid. Amen. You know what? They're not stupid, they're disobedient because they know better, but they want yeah. favor of man and they think they set themselves apart and make themselves different. Come on. They'll get all this favor. Yo, you'll get favor of man, but someday you won't deal with God. So I'm not wanting to bring us down I just want to be daddy, right? Yeah. Son, you're going to the prom tonight. That's good, but. <laughs> Dear, you got the new dress and your cute guy, pe but. So daddy's giving your butt this morning, right? Daddy's saying, uh, well, we could go a lot of places with that, but <laughs> chewing your butt, kicking your butt. No, none of that. I just want us to continue on the trajectory of all these ministry gifts, that have, and a lot of these ministry gifts minister in ministries a hundred times larger than this ministry. And a lot of their ministries are larger than this ministry. It's the favor of God that brings them here. But we're not looking at them. It's easy for them to minister because of the favor of God that's on you. And I want to commend you for having your heart and mind ready. If not, I don't care how anointed these people were, it wouldn't happen. It's a two-way street. Sometimes, you know, I'll preach long. Occasionally, right? Pretty often, right? <laughs> Most of the time, probably. Anyway, and Steph, look, give me that look. Sometimes it's like, oh, my God, it's 1230. What are you starting at 10? Worship team say, well, my God, if he came in here before the worship session was over, he wouldn't be here all day. They didn't say that, but they could have. I don't know. But anyway, if you did, check your heart. Because <laughs> I'm preparing my heart. Well, you prepared too much. You went too long. And I, but I don't gauge. I do want to respect time. But the main thing I gauge is, are you receiving? And when I see 80%, 85 of the people glued receiving, I, I'm, I'm not going to pull the food back. Then I'll see people move around. If you get up and go, you know, whatever. Oh, okay, I'll watch. But I'm going more by Holy Spirit. Are you done? Right? Well, why is that? Because I can't release more than you can receive, right? And the revelation won't flow out of me at a greater level than what you can receive. So as we, you, I give, you receive, I give, I'm receiving back from you. Revelation breeds revelation. Revelation births revelation. What is it? Revelation is a revealed word of God. 
It's uncovering the mind and heart and voice of God in a situation, revealing God. And in that, it's ultimately revealing who we are designed to be and that we are to be obedient to our design. If you're not the head and you feel like you're the tail or you think you're the tail, that's not God's design. That's disobedience. If you feel like weapons are hitting you and, the, and there's no answer, it's disobedience because that's unbelief and not knowing and trusting God enough to know that if you stand and believe and do what he said do, it's going to turn in your favor one way or another. See, disobedience is not just cursing or doing something you know is outright sin, whatever it is. What the Bible says is sin, right? But, but, but it's more than that. Disobedience is, is our heart contrite toward God or toward our situation. 